Good morning, and this is the larynx, and we'll talk about uh, a little bit about technique, normal anatomy, and, and common pathology. So these are the things that we're going to cover. So a technique standpoint, <clears throat> right now, currently, I think all of us are using some type of multi-detector imaging. At least at our institution, we're using 0 0.625 acquisitions. Uh, we're looking approximately 2.5 millimeters with a 1.25 millimeter overlap. We always give contrast on our laryngeal CTs, approximately 100 cc's. We're using a dual phase where we give 50 cc's and then wait, and then we give another bolus of contrast. And, and part of that is with multi-detector CT, you know, it takes about eight seconds to do a CT if you have a 64 slice CT. And when MDCT first came out with 64 slices, now you have 320s. Um, everybody was getting CTAs on all their neck CTs. So we had to uh, throttle back a little bit. So that's why we use the dual phase. Um, we don't use the quiet respirations uh, and the various laryngeal maneuvers. I know when I was a, a resident and we had one of the first spiral CTs in the country, so we looked at Valsalvas, reverse, reverse Valsalvas, so on and so forth. But we do everything with quiet respiration. Every, all of our studies now get sagittal and coronal reformats. I think it's so much easier to do now. I remember the good old days where it used to take a couple of hours to get these reformats and then they'd be printed on the hard copy and so on and so forth. But obviously now it just takes uh, just a couple seconds to do the, the reformats and it certainly helps when we're looking at various spread patterns. Just a nice example here, this was a laryngocele. We'll have more to say about that, but on the coronal images we can see very nicely the internal component of the laryngocele going through the thyrohyoid membrane and then the cystic component extending outside of the thyrohyoid membrane. So there's your, if you will, complex laryngocele. You can perform laryngeal MR on 1.5 or 3T. This is performed on the 3T weighted, uh, on the, uh, 3T weighted MR. I have to admit, um, at our institution and all my prior institutions, we do a lot more CT than we do MR. Um, in general, I think in the US, we do a little bit more CT than MR. In Europe, my colleagues do a lot more MR. From my standpoint, either one is fine. It's just that um, when, I look at a when I look at a modality, I want to see if we do 100 patients, what percent of those 100 patients are going to have diagnostic quality studies, um, especially if you have advanced laryngeal carcinoma. The patient swallows, they move their head a little bit. Even if it's in the last 10 seconds of that two-minute acquisition, you know, whole thing's degraded. And um, at, certainly at 3T, the motion artifact is a little bit more exacerbated. So that's why we use a little bit more CT. I mean, it just takes literally just 20 seconds to, to do a next CT. Um, one of the things, again, like I learned before, radiologically, uh, oftentimes the imaging manifestations are, are protean for many of these pathologies. There's a squamous cell carcinoma. That's actually tuberculosis, path proven. And this could easily be a squamous cell carcinoma. This, on the other hand, is a densely enhancing mass, and just, this just happens to be a submucosal paraganglioma. So an unusual case, you can see that this has a different appearance compared to the more run-of-the-mill squamous cell carcinoma. So this can tip you off that you're dealing with a, more of a highly vascular lesion. So let's talk about anatomy. Anatomy, anatomy, anatomy. I think one of the common themes is, as, as Dr. Sam mentioned, anatomy is key. I, I, I know many of you know in, in my position, um, the anatomy for both medical schools is still under radiology. And I know Dr. Pochin set that up. And I think, um, as usual, he was way ahead of his times. And uh, so, so much of what we do in radiology is anatomy. And I'm going to sp spend a fair amount of time going uh, over the anatomy. Because, um, you know, when we talk about the, the anatomy of the larynx, it's almost like a word salad. It's aryepiglottic fold, thyroepiglottic uh, ligament, cricothyroid cartilage, thyroidine muscles, and I can go on and on and just confuse the living daylights out of you. And, you know, it always confused me when I was a resident until I had, you know, I'm not the smartest tool in the shed, but one day my 20 watt light bulb went off and I had my eureka moment. And that was that all of these structures in the larynx, all these muscles and all, all the membranes are named after the cartilaginous and bony framework of the, of the larynx. So, you know, this is what structure right here. Some, and somebody just yelled it out. We're all friends here. Unless you're from Ohio State. It's okay. That's, <laughs> it's a, that's a joke. Not really, but I had to say it's a joke. Otherwise, I could get in trouble. No. Uh, so anyway, this is what here? There's your epiglottis. So the epiglottis is an anterior and midline structure. And what cartilage are we looking at right here? That's the, 
arytenoid cartilage, right? And this is actually the corniculate cartilage. We try to ignore that one. It almost looks like the sorting hat from Harry Potter. But if you look at the fold of tissue that runs from the arytenoid cartilage to the epiglottis, and this is referred to as what? The airy epiglottic fold. That's where it gets its name from. So the epiglottis is an anterior and midline structure, and the airy epiglottic fold is a paramidline structure. When you look in what the surgeon sees, here's the epiglottis anteriorly, and here's the airy epiglottic fold, which are paramidline structures. By the way, what structure is located here? That's a sac-like saddle structure here. It's the piriform sinus, exactly right. So if you have this fold of tissue that um, goes from the epiglottis to the tongue base, again, think Greek roots, what would you call this midline fold that runs from the, the epiglottis to the tongue base? So it's the median glossoepiglottic fold. Now, what about the muscles that run from the thyroid cartilage to the arytenoid cartilage? What would you call those muscles? Take a wild guess. Those are the thyroarytenoid muscles. What do you call the ligament that runs from the hyoid bone to the epiglottis? That's the hyoepiglottic ligament. See, there's nothing fancy about it. You just have to remember that the cartilage of the, lar of the excuse me, all these structures are named after the cartilaginous and bony framework. So if you remember the hyoid bone and the epiglottis, there's your hyoepiglottic ligament. If you remember the arytenoid cartilage and the epiglottis, there's your airy epiglottic fold. If you remember the thyroid cartilage and the arytenoid, uh, arytenoid cartilage, that's your thyroarytenoid muscles. If you remember the cricoid cartilage and the arytenoid cartilage, this is your cricoarytenoid ligaments, and so on and so forth. So if you understand that, then I think everything else makes a lot of sense. So let's go ahead and step through the anatomy, 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 and talk about the various uh, primary sites. So as I mentioned, the epiglottis is an anterior and it's a midline structure, as is seen here on this illustration. And here's a schematic illustration of an epiglottic carcinoma. Remember, the epiglottis is an anterior and midline structure. So clinically, this is an epiglottic carcinoma seen at endoscopy. It's anterior. And this is what we see radiologically. So how do we determine that? Well, as I mentioned before, it's pretty simple. You just look anterior and midline, and there's your epiglottic carcinoma. It's anterior and it's midline. The airy epiglottic fold is a paramidline structure, and it runs from the arytenoid cartilage to the lateral aspect of the epiglottis. So this is what the clinicians see at endoscopy, and this is what we see radiologically. Here's our epiglottis anterior and midline, Here's our airy epiglottic fold, and here is this uh, polypoid uh, carcinoma involving the right airy epiglottic fold. Here's the normal airy epiglottic fold on the left side. On the CT scan, what structure is here? Anybody? Anterior midline? Yeah, but if you don't shout out, I'm going to start calling on people, all right? So there's anterior. You think I'm joking, right? I know a lot of people in this room from the last 10 years, so... And funny how no one makes eye contact now after I said that, but that's okay. So here's the epiglottis, right, Kevin? There's the anterior midline structures, right? So there's the epiglottis. On the left-hand side, there's the normal airy epiglottic fold, and here's the piriform sinus. On the contralateral side, we can see that the airy epiglottic fold um, contains this mass, so there's our carcinoma. And look what it's doing to the piriform sinus. It's actually pinching it off. Important to remember this when we talk about vocal cord palsies because the uh, uh, in vocal cord palsies, the ipsilateral piriform sinus is going to be dilated. Conceptually, this is the hardest one for me, and this is the false vocal cord. Um, and uh, a tough structure, but this is the way that I conceptualize it. The airy epiglottic fold comes down, and eventually the inferior reflection of the airy epiglottic fold attaches to the top of the arytenoid cartilage. So when I'm looking at a CT scan, what I tend to look for is the top of the arytenoid cartilage. So in the schematic illustration, here's the false vocal cord. The black area here is the laryngeal ventricle, and this is the true vocal cord. So on our schematic illustration, this inferior reflection of the airy epiglottic fold is indicative of the false vocal cord. Here's the black area, the laryngeal ventricle, and there's our true vocal cord. So when we look at a CT scan, clinically, here was a, a false vocal cord carcinoma. And there are two structures here on the CT scan that tells me that we're at the level of the false vocal cord. One is that we're looking at the top of the arytenoid cartilage. So if you see the top of the arytenoid cartilage, that tells me we're at the level of the false vocal cord. Secondly, with a leap of faith, sometimes you'll see this strip of tissue on the left-hand side, and that's the lateral thyroarytenoid muscle.
So those two structures indicate that we're at the level of the false vocal cord. Sometimes I have a hard time seeing the lateral thyroid muscle, especially as we become more dose conscious. We, sometimes we just don't have the MA that we did um, 15 years ago before we really started being concerned with the dose uh, restrictions that we uh, currently are under. So this tissue is, uh, this muscle is not as consistent, if you will, but by the same token, we can always see the top of the arytenoid cartilage. So when I see this, I am pretty comfortable we're at the level of the false vocal cord. The true vocal cord is very easy, very, very simple to see because the true vocal cord is located at the cricoarytenoid joint. So when we see the cricoarytenoid joint, we know we're at the level of the true vocal cord. So here's a schematic illustration of a true vocal cord carcinoma. There's our arytenoid cartilage, there's our cricoid cartilage, cricoarytenoid joint, and here we can see the typical spread patterns of a true vocal cord carcinoma. Here's a verrucoid carcinoma involving the right true vocal cord, and this is what we see on CT scan. So there's our cricoid cartilage, there's our arytenoid cartilage, cricoarytenoid joint, and here is our true vocal cord carcinoma. In this particular case, the true vocal cord carcinoma is extending all the way anterior to this specific location at the true vocal cord. It's anterior, and this is the anterior commissure. Conversely, this is the posterior commissure. So in this case, here's a true vocal cord carcinoma. We know it has to be cricoarytenoid joint growing anteriorly all the way to the anterior commissure. The foundation of the larynx is the cricoid cartilage. So I think of the, the cricoid cartilage um, analogous to the foundation of our house. If we don't have a foundation of our house, everything is going to collapse. And the cricoid cartilage is the signet ring, which the way I conceptualize things, holds the whole laryngeal framework intact. If there was no cricoid cartilage, our larynx is going to end up by our thyroid, uh, our thyroid gland. So the cricoid cartilage is very important, but this really constitutes the subglottis. So everywhere that we see the cricoid cartilage, that's essentially where the subglottis is located. So this is a pathologic specimen of a primary subglottis carcinoma and the way we know we're at the level of the subglottis is we look for the signet ring of the cricoid cartilage. It literally looks like a big O, a, a big, big O. And there should just be just this thin, thin rim of mucosa as is seen here. So if you will, this is a normal appearing cricoid cartilage. This is a normal mucosa overlying the cricoid cartilage. But instead of seeing this thickness, uh, in this uh, large subglottic carcinoma, we can see this circumferential thickening of the subglottis, and this is a typical appearance of a subglottic carcinoma. These tip, as they get larger, they tend to be circumferential, and because they tend to present later as opposed to a true vocal cord carcinoma, they're oftentimes associated with fairly extensive erosion of the cartilages. In this case, both the cricoid cartilage is eroded and the thyroid cartilage is eroded. So we'll talk about you know, various other tumors. What I've done so far is gone over the technique and the anatomy. And when I went over the anatomy, I've implicitly gone over the typical radiological features of squamous cell carcinoma. They tend to be very bland. And as I mentioned before, the larynx is in the visceral space. So anytime you perform the endoscopy, everything that you see, including the mucosa over the larynx, is in the visceral space. Now, what are some other tumors that we have to consider in the differential diagnosis? And what I hope to do is that just instead of going through all the tumors and by the end of the talk you say, ah, they all look like everything else, which is possible. That's a possible. But sometimes there are some differentiating features that can tell us um, that this indeed is a different type of tumor than our standard run-of-the-mill squamous cell carcinoma. So here's an example of a lesion that's involving the larynx is primarily located to the cricoid cartilage. So anybody want to take a guess at what this is? When we do the bone algorithms, we can see that it's not um, primarily mucosal, it's submucosal and really limited to the cricoarytenoid joint. And if, um, if, and I never saw this as a resin, maybe that's why I didn't go into musculoskeletal. If I told you that there were rings and circles here, then what would the uh, diagnosis be? Anybody? Chondrosarcoma, exactly right. And achondrosarcomas are actually not un uncommon in the larynx. They typically present as a submucosal mass. Uh, 
the, the surgeons tell me they tend to be fairly rock hard when they go down and they, and they look at the mass. Is that, where are my surgeons in the audience there? You guys, is that true or not? Or am I making that up? I trust you guys. So, and that's, are you guys out there? Correct or incorrect? Yes or no? Maybe? All right. No one's saying anything. Okay. <laughs> the, the second, uh, another common tumor involving the larynx is if it's not squamous cell carcinoma, when you're looking at a mucosal tumor, and they can also be submucosal, but in general, they're mucosal lesions. These tend to be the various minor salivary gland tumors. And the most common are going to be the mucoepidermoid carcinomas and adenoid cystic carcinomas of the malignant variety. So this is just an example of um, a, a malignant minor salivary gland tumor. In this case, this was adenoid cystic carcinoma. But unfortunately, the radiological appearance is very similar. But on the other hand, from a statistical standpoint, one, two, and three, when you see a malignancy involving the mucosa, is going to be squamous cell carcinoma. Another example of a minor salivary gland tumor, this in fact was a mucoepidermoid carcinoma. This was involving the subglottis. And unfortunately, the radiological appearance is indistinguishable from squamous cell carcinoma in this case. So we just have to add it to our differential diagnosis. But on the other hand, this was kind of an interesting case. This was actually a benign minor salivary gland tumor. This was a pleomorphic adenoma that was involved in the larynx. And this was a gradient echo image. In this case, it was very, very high signal on T2. So if we see a solid tumor that's high signal on 2 involving the larynx, that is not the typical finding of squamous cell carcinoma. But in fact, this was a pleomorphic adenoma. So in fact, if we transpose this into the parotid gland, then we could easily say that this was a pleomorphic adenoma involving the parotid gland. In this particular case, it just happened to be in, in the larynx. Now, this was a, a, a sort of a, 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 a tumor that's uh, localized to the larynx. This is a granular cell tumor. And, you know, we published on this a few years ago. And it does have, uh, I would say, a, a characteristic spread pattern. You know, a lot of the granular cell tumors are, um, are, are, are never imaged. They're, they tend to be smaller lesions. Uh, the surgeons tell me they can go in there and, and resect it uh, fairly easily. But sometimes what happens with granular cell tumors, when they get to imaging, it's almost like the tip of the iceberg phenomena. So the surgeons will go in and they'll shave off and, and resect the granular cell carcinoma, the granular cell tumor. And then the patient recurs. And they'll go back and, and, and resect it again. And the, oftentimes the patients will come back for multiple resections. Well, they'll be able to get the endolaryngeal component. But in those granular cell tumors that have multiple recurrences, these tumors tend, if you will, to have a deep, or if you want to use the term endophytic, it's fine. But they have this deep spread. So the, by the time they hit imaging, these tumors have a substantial submucosal component to it. And you know, like I said, if it was a squamous cell carcinoma, the patients would have clearly presented. But the fact that they've had multiple shavings and you have this appearance, this really, I think, is due to incomplete resection and um, unbeknownst to the surgeon, a very deep spread. So when I see something like this and it's not squamous cell carcino carcinoma, then I do start thinking granular cell tumors. And this is the classical appearance of a subglottic hemangioma. I think we all know what age group this comes in. It's a, the younger kids, oftentimes they don't get imaged. The, the surgeons will just go in. The pediatric otolaryngologist can go in there and resected, and oftentimes they don't come to imaging. However, when they do come to imaging, here's a typical densely enhancing lesion involving the larynx. Now, some surgeons may resect it, or because it is a hemangioma, they have a proliferative phase and an involuting phase. And if there's no significant compression to the airway, then some pediatric otolaryngologists will just feel comfortable following it. In this particular case, a nice example here of a subglottic hemangioma. Again, it's below the level of the true vocal cord, so it's involved in the subglottis. Remember, at the level of the cricoid cartilage, we can't see the cricoid cartilage. Why? Because in a kid, the cricoid isn't opacified. But if we look for that O-shaped structure, we know we're at the level of the subglottis, and we can see the pretty typical appearance of the dense enhancement of a subglottic hemangioma. Well, what about the various infections and in inflammatory processes? Well, uh, one of the more common things that occur in the larynx is Wegener's granulomatosis. And uh, Wegener's is a granulomatous vasculitis. It's probably uh, immune-related. 
There's a classic form where you have necrotizing granulomas of the upper and lower respiratory tracts. It's also a systemic vasculitis that can result in focal necrotizing glomerulitis. Now, when it's in the larynx, uh, Wegner's uh, typically involves the larynx in the region of the subglottis. And again, it causes a narrowing or stenosis. And people usually present with sore throat, laryngitis, or the fevers and the arthralgias. And this is an endoscopic view of Wegener's granulomatosis. And this is what we see radi radiologically. And unfortunately, this looks just like squamous cell carcinoma. Now, the granular cell tumors, well, they would expect to have a little bit more extension into the anterior neck. But this circumferential involvement involving the subglottis, the differential is going to be squamous cell number one, minor salivary gland number two. But if the surgeons tell you they do not see a mucosal lesion, the biopsies were all negative for a tumor, then we have to consider Wegener's granulomatosis. And this is two examples of pathologically proven Wegener's. Notice on this case, we don't have the smooth O-shaped appearance, but we can see this irregularity involving the mucosa of the larynx. So think Wegener's granulomatosis. Another example here, non-contrast T1-weighted contrast enhanced T1-weighted image. This is way too much enhancement involving the subglottis. Again, it should be very thin and very fine enhancement. Um, but instead, we have this very thick enhancement of the subglottis. The other thing that we have to think about, too, when we see Wegner's is sarcoid. So sarcoidosis can have the exact same appearance as Wegner. So when I see this, I think I always say, you know, Wegner's sarcoid. So back when I was taking my boards and I saw something weird in the abdomen, you know, I would say TB sarcoid lymphoma. I don't know if they still teach the residents that, but TB sarcoid lymphoma. So in the larynx, I, I think about sarcoid Wegner's, and especially if the patient is from India or South America, I always throw in tuberculosis as well, too. So those are the three things that I combine um, if uh, it's not squamous cell carcinoma. Here's an example of an unusual case. Here's a, a laryngeal abscess that's involving the free margin of the epiglottis. So we have a suprahyoid and an infrahyoid component of the epiglottis. We refer to this area right at the top as the suprahyoid or particularly the free margin of the epiglottis, and there's our laryngeal abscess. If we have a diffuse inflammation involving the supraglottic larynx, then this is what's referred to as a supraglottitis. In the kids, this would sometimes is epiglottitis, but in the adult, some people refer to this as an adult form of epiglottitis. Again, I kind of use this with a little trepidation um, because it's not fully accepted, but in general, you can think of supraglottitis as somewhat akin to an epiglottitis. So what does it look like? Well, they can be extraordinarily severe and, and quite scary to look at, if you will, because it's a, a pretty severe infection. There's a diffuse enlargement of the, air, of the epiglottis, diffuse swelling of the airy epiglottic folds and the false focal cords. Here we can see diffuse enhancement, and oftentimes you'll have obliteration of the pre-epiglottic and the paraglottic fat. Notice also there's uh, edema involving the retropharyngeal space and thickening and reticulation of the platysma and the adjacent fat. And look what it's doing to the submandibular gland. It's actually um, causing reticulation uh, of the fat surrounding the submandibular gland. When we talk about soft tissue infections of the larynx, this is primarily endolaryngeal, if you will. So this is the inflammation of the supraglottis itself. But soft tissues infections can have infections involving the skin over the larynx. So this is the erysipelas. You can have inflammations of the subcutaneous tissues. That's your cellulitis. We will talk a little bit about this disease entity, necrotizing fasciitis, and if it involves some muscles, it's a myositis. Now, necrotizing fasciitis, um, everyone's heard of this, obviously, and the lay public has heard of this, too, because every six years or so, there'll be an article on the front page of the New York Times or the Washington Post or something giving the other name for necrotizing fasciitis. Anybody remember what that is? It's yeah, flesh-eating bacteria, right? The old flesh-eating bacteria. So that's, uh, uh, in, uh, in our nomenclature, we refer to this as necrotizing fasciitis. And how do we make the diagnosis of it? In the early stage of necrotizing fasciitis, it looks just like any other infection. You can see the, the reticulation of the fat, the obliteration of the normal fat planes by 
intermediate soft tissue. And we can't do anything about it. But what's the finding here that tells you that you're dealing with necrotizing fasciitis? It's the air, exactly right. So if I told you that this patient had no history of trauma and there was no history of, of chemotherapy or radiation therapy, the patient did have a pretty severe fever, then that's the diagnosis of necrotizing fasciitis. If you do have a patient that's had chemotherapy or radiation therapy, then all bets are off. Because laryngeal or chondronecrosis can develop air or gas following the treatment, and this can dissect along the fascial plane. So when you see something, when you see that air where it shouldn't be, the first thing you've got to ask yourself is, have, has the patient had any trauma? Um, or on the other hand, have they had chemotherapy and radiation therapy? If they haven't, then you have to start thinking about neck. We can also have other etiologies involved in the larynx that are developmental in origin. And, you know, I'll spend a couple of seconds, again, like, yeah, like I said, I've been doing what I'm doing for 25 years, and some of the concepts that come naturally to people, I just, I still, it takes me a while to get it. So one of these things is about the thyroid gland. And I would always get confused about lingual thyroid and thyroglossal duct cysts and so on and so forth. I, I'd always get confused. But again, my 15-watt light bulb went on one day, and I thought, I got it. Yeah, I got it. And the way to, that I think about it is that the thyroid gland has its normal descent. So it forms, anybody remember where it forms at? Remember the name of the foramen? The foramen cecum, right. So the foramen, it forms right at the tongue base, and we'll go over this a little bit later, but eventually ends up having a relative descent where it ends up in the anterior portion of your neck. So anywhere along that course, it can leave little driblets or droplets or, or little footprints where it came from. And if you have thyroid tissue that is left by the normal descent, and that thyroid tissue is essentially solid, then you have lingual thyroid. But if you leave that thyroid tissue and it still has secretory elements where it starts secreting fluid and it starts to blow up like a water balloon, then you have a thyroglossal duct cyst. So again, in, in my very simplistic way of thinking of things, if you have a balloon and it's not blown up, it's just sitting there and it's all solid, then that's akin to lingual thyroid or ectopic thyroid tissue. But if you take that balloon and you fill it up with water, then you have a thyroglossal duct cyst. So this is an example of a lingual thyroid. So this is at the level of the frame and cecum. This is a contrast enhanced CT scan. We can see this densely um, enhancing mass. Again, you look at this, wow, could it be a paraganglioma? Could it be a, a hypervascular minor salivary gland tumor? So on and so forth. Um, it tips you off that you're right at the level of the foramen cecum, and when you do a CT scan at the level of the thyroid gland, there's no thyroid tissue whatsoever. So this uh, supports that you're dealing with a lingual thyroid, not a thyroglossal duct cyst. Why? Because this is a solid enhancing lesion, a lingual thyroid. Another example here, um, T2 weighted image, contrast, uh, non-contrast uh, T1, contrast enhanced T1. Boy, it looks just like squamous cell carcinoma. But on the other hand, if you, on the back of your mind, especially if they were hypothyroid, then you have to consider the diagnosis of a lingual thyroid tissue. But the key thing is that tip off based on that location. Uh, another example here, sagittal T1 weighted image is a nice example here of the lingual thyroid tissue. If you're not sure, you can do it also, in addition to a CT, do a nuclear medicine study. And in this take, case, we can see the protectinate uptake that corresponds with the abnormality that we see on the non-contrast T1 weighted MR. Well, as I mentioned before, the thyroid gland has this relative ascent, and you can now have a thyroglossal duct cyst. So this is involving the foramen cecum, this is involving the hyoid bone, and this is involving the uh, infrahyoid larynx, if you will. Now, thyroglossal duct cyst. This is a thyroglossal duct cyst. Is there thyroid tissue? Yes. Technically, it's ectopic thyroid, but it contains fluid. So then the real challenge is, is how do we know that these guys right here are thyroglossal duct cyst? Is it the fact that uh, it's paramidline? Is it the fact that it's midline? Unilocular or multilocular? The bottom line is, is that none of those are really definitive. What's definitive to me is that this is located and embedded within the strap muscles. 
because it's a strap muscle. You don't need to perform CT scans to, to say that you have a thyroglossal duct cyst. Thyroglossal duct cysts move on swallowing. So if someone swallows, the, the lesion moves. Right? So think about how the larynx works. Again, this is my simplistic way of looking at things. When you swallow, what happens? Your soft palate closes, your epiglottis flips down so the food doesn't go down your larynx. But the other way your body helps you not aspirate is that the larynx comes up. And so when the larynx comes up, then the epiglottis closes the opening to the larynx. So you have two things happening. So how does the larynx come up? It is pulled up by the strap muscles. So it's almost like an elevator. How does an elevator rise? It gets pulled up by the pulleys. So the strap muscles are like pulleys that elevate the larynx. So as a result, when a thyroglossal duct cyst occurs, the way the referring physician makes a diagnosis is they ask the patient to swallow and to see if the mass moves is on swallowing, i.e. on deglutination. So this essentially is the radiological correlate to the clinical phenomena that's occurring. This lesion is embedded in the strap muscles, so therefore when the strap muscle moves in swallowing, the lesion follows the strap muscles. So it's not the unilocularity, the multilocularity, the midline, the paramidline. It's the fact that this lesion, these thyroglossal duct cysts are embedded in the strap muscle. That to me is the most, uh, most uh, convincing um, uh, finding that we're dealing with the thyroglossal duct cyst. The type of surgery that's performed is a cystern procedure. In this case, they take a cuff, a cuff of tissue and follow it back all the way to the anterior neck. And this happens to be the little duct associated with the thyroglossal duct cyst. This is a benign thyroglossal duct cyst. They can be very large, but on the other hand, this is a thyroglossal duct cyst that has a diffusely enhancing mass within it. And what do you guys think this is? Yeah, it's papillary thyroid carcinoma. So papillary thyroid carcinoma has been associated with thyroglossal duct cyst. It's pretty rare. I mean, I think it's 6 to 7%, at least in my experience, it's probably less than that. But um, a coincidental or concomitant papillary thyroid carcinomas can occur in thyroglossal duct cyst, so we have to be aware of that. If you have dilatation here of the laryngeal ventricle, you then have a, a laryngocele. And the laryngoceles can be deep to the thyrohyoid membrane, in which case it's called a simple laryngocele. But if it extends through the thyrohyoid membrane into the soft tissues of neck, then you can have a complex or a mixed laryngocele. In this case, the most common cause that we see, um, especially in my old institution and now, now, is squamous cell carcinoma, something that's occluding the laryngeal ventricle. I know back when I was a resident, um, it was due to uh, trumpet players and glass blowers. I never met a glass blower until four years ago, when I, until I went to Holland. I don't know if you've been to Holland, Michigan, or you've been to the glass blowers. I finally met a glass blower, and he did have a laryngocele, so I'll get up grant him that much. Um, but by the same token, globally, the cause of laryngoceles tend not to be trumpet players or people like Dizzy Gillespie, because um, most of us don't do that. But it tends to be squamous cell carcinoma, which ends up including the laryngeal ventricle and then leads to dilatation of the, of the uh, laryngeal ventricle. Another example of a laryngocele, this was due, again, due to uh, squamous cell carcinoma uh, on the left-hand side and this particular case on the right-hand side. So this is air-filled and they can be fluid filled. And when they become infected, you can develop uh, what we refer to as a laryngopiocele, or you can call it a pyolaryngocele, whichever suits, suits your preference. In this case, that's a mixed or a complex laryngopiocele. We can have arteriovenous malformations uh, uh, involving uh, the larynx as well, too. In this particular case, this was involving the floor of the mouth. And here's a arterial venous malformation involving the larynx. This is it on MR. Kind of tough to see, but certainly when you do a CT scan, and this, this particular case a CT, unequivocal, we can see a substantial amount of flow in all these multiple dilated vessels submucosally at the level of the true vocal cord, at the level of the supraglottic larynx, and at the level of the subglottic larynx. Again, we know we're at the level of true vocal cord because of what the cricoarytenoid joint. The last thing that we'll talk about in the remaining time is vocal cord palsy. Uh, 
Um, and just to give you a couple tips, because it's probably, if you're in a general practice, it's probably one of the most confusing things that you see. Because in this particular case, we see this mass right here, and we just talk about supraglottic carcinomas and areopiglottic fold carcinomas, and you see, my gosh, uh, something's not right here involved in the areopiglottic fold. Is this a squamous cell carcinoma? Well, it can be confusing, but some of the tricks of the trades that I've learned over time is that if you do see this paramedian appearance uh, to the area epiglottic fold, look at that ipsilateral piriform sinus. If this was a large mass, as I showed before, that piriform sinus on, would be compressed, but instead it's dilated. So that tells you you're having an ex vacuo phenomena. On the left-hand side, the recurrent laryngeal nerve wraps around the aortic arch. And on the right-hand side, it wraps around the subclavian artery. So in this particular case, this vocal cord palsy was due to this bronchogenic carcinoma that was involving the mediastinum, particularly at the AP window, because you can see this is located just below the aortic arch. Well, where do we specifically should we look for vocal cord palsies? Certainly, we need to look at the brain to make sure there's not an infarct, but particularly, we need to pay attention uh, here uh, to the um, tracheoesophageal groove. So there's our trachea, there's the esophagus. So we need to look and analyze these fat planes very, very carefully. Another example of a vocal cord palsy, in this case, the paramedian area epiglottic fold. Here's our area epiglottic fold. Look at the ipsilateral piriform sinus. It's dilated. In this particular case, there's also dilatation of the laryngeal ventricle. So you see something like this, you're not sure. Where should your eye go to next? Look at the ipsilateral piriform sinus. Look at the laryngeal ventricle. These two things are dilated. There's no way a mass that big uh, could be a mass that big, right? It should have some type of compression, but instead we see ex vacuo phenomena. In this particular case, this was due to this. This, in fact, was a little aneurysm, probably a ductus aneurysm arising from the aortic arch, again, pinching off on the left-hand side the left recurrent laryngeal nerve. Another example here of a vocal cord palsy, again, pyramiding cord, the arytenoid is tipped immediately. This on MR, there is dilatation of the piriform sinus. And in fact, when we look at the mediastinum, this was due to a huge aortic aneurysm, again, clipping off the recurrent laryngeal nerve. This is a, a nice paper written by, uh, I think, Hugh Curtin a few years ago, demonstrating that not only can we determine whether or not there's a vocal cord palsy, we can look at chronicity. And if indeed we look at the thyro, uh, 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 excuse me, the, uh, uh, the thyroid, uh, the, uh, the groove, sorry about that, uh, we can see, in this case, denervation atrophy. We can see fatty replacement of the muscle. So if we look, I got it now, the tracheoesophageal groove. If we look at the tracheoesophageal groove, we also need to look at the various uh, cricoid and cricorytenoid muscles. Notice the normal appearance on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we can see there's fatty replacements. So and that tells us we're dealing with chronic denervation atrophy. So, so it's not acute vocal cord palsy, but it's certainly longstanding. Another example here, chronic vocal cord palsy. Look at the denervation atrophy involving some of the, the uh, paraglottic musculature on the left and compared to the right, again, due to bronchogenic carcinoma. Because sometimes these vocal cord palsies are due to, they're acute, and if we can't see anything else that's causing it, we just sort of, as, as uh, Dr. Sam said, we just describe it to a viral process. But on the other hand, if we look at this and we begin to see the denervation atrophy, and we really have to look for some anatomic basis for the vocal cord palsy. So that's why I think it's important that we look at the postcricoid musculature and we also look at the paraglottic musculature as well too because that typically tells us there's something more ominous. How do they treat this? They can treat this with Teflon injection or some type of silicone replacement. So essentially there is a mechanical displacement of the vocal cord medially. So this vocal cord essentially becomes fixed pyramidline, so the normal vocal cord can begin to oppose itself and you can recreate your function. So in this particular case, this was a Teflon injection at the uh, level of the cricoid joint. You can also put a piece of silicon there. This is uh, still referred to, I believe, as a Yashiki procedure where they can place the silicon submucosally at the level of the true vocal cord. 
the thing about these Teflon injections is that if, uh, if you do have bad luck, if you will, you can inject a silicon, but it can also result in a, a gross inflammatory response. And in fact, this was a Teflon granuloma formation. So this appearance in and of itself is, is fine. This appearance in and of itself is fine. But if you start developing this additional soft tissue that essentially creates a rind uh, uh, along where we see this radio density, this is not normal. And that's uh, typically due to granuloma formation along the implant. So in summary, what I've tried to do over the last 40 minutes is talk a little bit about the technique. We talked about the anatomy, tumors, infections, and inflammatory processes, developmental, and we ended up with vocal cord palsy. So thank you very much for your attention. And we'll go for a break, and we'll see you back here at 11 o'clock. Thanks.